the secure transaction students. We meet now to continue our exploration of the enforcement of a security interest. We've learned how to create one, how to try at least to ensure that you have a first priority security interest. And now imagine you do, all of that has gone well, but then your debtor defaults and you need to enforce your security interest. We've talked about repossession to secure the collateral, protect the collateral, make it easier to sell the collateral because you can even you can have it present at an auction, for example, or at least assure the buyers that you have possession of it. But I want to make one thing clear, and this was not made clear to me uh, when I studied secured transactions as a law student, and I wondered about it for a while. But when you repossess a piece of collateral, when you repossess collateral, you do not have title to that collateral. You don't own it. You're a secured party. You have the right to repossess it, to have possession of it. But the title still resides in the debtor. But as the secured party, you have the right to transfer that title. So you never own the collateral, but you have the right to sell it, and then you get the proceeds, apply it against the outstanding obligation, and return the rest to the debtor. So keep that in mind. There is a way that a secured party can acquire title to collateral, but that is through the process of strict foreclosure, which is uh, will be covered in a, in a future video, in the next video. For now, we're going to talk about uh, resale and a couple of other ways to uh, enforce your security interest against particular types of collateral. So let's jump right into it. We have problem 135, and it's about Wonderspa. And Wonderspa gave Antitrust National Bank a security interest in its accounts receivable and its chattel paper, right? Accounts coupled with a security interest in the probably the spas that they sold. Uh, when Wonderspa missed two payments in a row, A and B notified the spa's customers that future payments should be made directly to the bank. Does the bank have that right? Yes. That's how you enforce the security interest against accounts receivable. You don't try to repossess them. You don't resell them. What you do is simply now you have the right to inform the customers that they have to pay you. And you remember we talked about... Uh, um, or maybe we did or didn't, uh, but the account debtor, and that's the name that's given to the person who owes Wonder Spa money for the spa that they bought on credit, they're known as the account debtor. Wonder Spa is the debtor, the customers that owe them money are the account debtor. Um, and when the secured party, after default, wants to enforce the security interest, they notify the account debtor that all payments must be made now to the secured party. If they don't make that notice, then the account debtor has a choice to either pay the, the original party, Wonder Spa, or the bank, Antitrust National Bank. And of course, as Antitrust National Bank, you don't want them to be paying Wonder Spa. You want them to be paying you, because God knows what Wonder Spa is going to do with their money. Uh, and so you have to send them a notice. Once you send them a notice, they have to send their monthly payments to you, Antitrust National Bank. If they send them after the notice to Wonder Spa, then those payments don't count to discharge their debt that they owe under this account receivable, they owe it to now to Antitrust National Bank. So as soon as there's default, you want to send out that notice and make sure that the account debtors know that they have to pay you. All right. Uh, if the spa stops opening its doors, need its former customers keep paying A and B?
and it goes on in the parentheses, the spot contracts did not mention the possibility that the contracts would be assigned. Uh, and yeah, um, they do have to, to pay uh, A and B. Um, even if there were a provision in the contract prohibiting assignment, um, you could sue the the debtor for allowing this assignment, or if there were, a, a, you know, it would be the debtor. The account debtor, this is an agreement between the account debtor, the person that bought the spa, and the uh, debtor, Wonder Spa. They sell the, the spa on, on credit, uh, but there's a provision in that agreement that says, we will not assign your account to anyone else, including Antitrust National Bank. Now, that's a contractual provision between the purchasers of the, of the spa and Wonder Spa. So if Wonder Spa does assign, and assign can be interpreted as giving as a security interest, it's a vague term. Uh, if they do give it as a security interest, then the account debtor could sue them for a breach of contract. However, it does not affect the right of the secured party uh, as the assignee or as the rights of a secured party it does not affect that. You can have an anti-assignment clause, but it doesn't prevent assignments. If they do breach it, you can sue them, um, but the rights of the secured party will be intact. They'll be able to enforce that security interest. So they can keep going even though they shut the doors and have an anti uh, assignment clause doesn't matter. Okay, uh, let's see if there's anything else in this problem. Really, just uh, uh, I think that's that's about it. So, just know uh, how to go about enforcing a security interest in accounts receivable. Um, you, know, you simply notify the account debtors to pay you, the secured party. And you have the right to do that, and once you notify them. The account debtors have the obligation to pay you and only you. Um, and even if there's an anti-assignment clause in the contract between the debtor and the account debtor, that doesn't affect the rights of the secured party to enforce their security interest. All right, let's move on to problem 136. After Night Flyer Loan Company had repossessed Lynn Brown's car, it decided to advertise it for bids in a local newspaper. Okay. Is this a private or a public sale? Now we're moving on to 9610, 9611, the provisions that govern the resale of collateral. And you'll see that 9610 allows that, and that's the, the typical way to sell collateral. There are specific types of collateral where you do things differently, such as accounts receivable, you notify the account debtor, uh, if you have a security interest in a bank account, you just ask the bank to transfer money to you. Uh, and the same with investment property. You have control over that investment, that brokerage account. You just inform the broker to transfer money over to you. Uh, you don't need to resell it. But uh, other types of collateral, you think of cars, boats, Printing presses, um, factory robots on the factory floor, uh, computers, chairs, tables, you know, all, all these uh, other things could be intellectual property. Um, what do you do? You resell them. And whatever you make on it, you apply towards your outstanding obligation. If there's anything left, then it goes to junior creditors, people that are behind you in the, in the credit line. Um, and then once they are satisfied, if there's anything left, it goes back to the debtor. That surplus goes back to the debtor. Um, uh, one thing to remember about 9610 and the resale of collateral is that every aspect, everything you do must be commercially reasonable. And how do you know? As a lawyer, I mean, we're lawyers. We know the law. But do we know the commercial practices of selling an airplane 
selling a printing press, selling a, uh, a painting, fine art? Do we know how those things are bought and sold? What's the commercial practice? So there's some risk there, but um, Article 9 addresses that and says that there's a safe harbor, that as long as you follow the practices of, of dealers in the, in the collateral of that kind, then that's a safe harbor. Then you've done what's commercially reasonable. So if you have a, a client that's a security interest in a piece of fine art, maybe a Leonardo da Vinci drawing, it's hanging in their office. Uh, if you've been to Cleveland Clinic or Progressive Insurance or even Cleveland Marshall College of Law, we all have art collections, some more valuable than others. Um, but let's say you're enforcing your security interest against fine art. It's a Leonardo da Vinci drawing. Do you know how to sell a Leonardo da Vinci original? I don't. So what you do is you call up the art dealers in Beverly Hills or in Italy and Rome and you document how they go about doing it. And they'll tell you, well, you must contact Sotheby's, some auction house, uh, and uh, present it for auction and this international auction. Let's imagine that's what they say, which is probably the case. Then you document that, write a file to the, or a memo to the file. Uh, that you talk to such and such uh, art dealer in Rome and in Beverly Hills, and they referred you to Sotheby's, and you spoke to Sotheby's, and they say, yes, this is we handle fine art such as Leonardo. Um, good. Now you're following the industry practice for selling collateral of that type. Uh, and then you go ahead and do it. And you put it up for auction in Sotheby's, and you follow all the protocols and procedures, sell it, and you keep the money and return the surplus to junior creditors or the, the debtor. Um, but one thing you have to do, so that's about commercial reasonability, uh, but there's another requirement, and that is the notice requirement. Uh, you need to put the debtor on notice as well as uh, anyone else who has an interest in the collateral. You have to provide them personal notice, written notice, uh, that you're going to conduct a sale. It's typically going to be a, an auction, a public sale. It can be a private sale where you don't have a publicized auction at Sotheby's or wherever else, um, but that depends on the collateral. And so you will, could be that you call the uh, art dealer in Rome and they say, well, if you have a, an original Leonardo, you don't take it to Sotheby's. You come to us and you ask us for a list of art collectors and we reach out to them privately. They like their anonymity. And the way to sell these things is through a private sale, not a public auction. And that's just going to depend on the, on the type of collateral. So it's possible to have a quiet private auction if that's the way it's done. Uh, and of course, remember, the point of all this commercial reasonability is to realize the highest price. You don't put it out on the curb and say, uh, Leonardo da Vinci painting will take the best offer. Um, because that's not likely to attract the interest of the collectors who have the millions to hundreds of millions to pay for a Leonardo da Vinci. And it may be that the public auction isn't right because these private collectors are afraid of being discovered. They like to be contacted privately. So it just depends on the, the industry and the collateral uh, about regarding how to go about selling these things. But you want to follow the industry practice, which will generally be the, the way to, re to realize the highest price. But you want to give the debtor and the other parties that have a security interest, that is, well, not only a security interest, but any interest, uh, a written notice, and it has to be uh, delivered in writing uh, within a reasonable time before the sale. Well, let's imagine it's a, a, a public auction, which is advertised. It has to be delivered within a reasonable time before that public auction. And there's a safe harbor for 10 days. 10 days before, that's okay. Now, how do you determine whether 
who has a an interest in a particular item, such as Leonardo da Vinci painting? Well, you do a search on the uh, Secretary of State's office at the location of the debtor, and you'll get security agreements or no, financing statements that will show up. And there you'll get, you can start compiling your list of people to, to give notice to. Um, but what if someone you know files a financing statement you know, just after you sent out notices, and now you haven't captured that one person? Is that going to uh, result in a violation of the law? There's another safe harbor that's built in, and I've got my statutory supplement here, and so should you. Um, it says here, persons to be notified under 611C, the debtor, any secondary obligor, if there's a surety that's uh, backing up the obligation of the debtor. Um, and then it says, uh, three, any other person from which the secured party has received before the notification date an authenticated notification of a claim. So if anyone... Before you send your notification out, which will be you know, roughly 10 days before your auction, if you've received notice from someone that says, hey, I've got an interest, doesn't matter what kind of interest, I have an interest in that, well, it's got to be some kind of property or security interest, you know, not just a cur an intellectual curiosity, um, but some kind of legal interest in the collateral, then you need to send them a notification of the sale, tell them where the auction's taking place, what is going to be sold, uh, the time of the of the auction, etc. And that is contained as, uh, um, uh, yes, the content, the form of the notification is spelled out quite explicitly. And there even, there's even uh, samples given in the statute. So you just copy what's in the statute if you want to avoid any legal challenges. But that's in 9.613. So you want to send it out um, 10 days before the auction. You want to send it to everyone that's declared to you, that's notified you that they have an interest uh, in the collateral. And you also want to run a, a search on the Secretary of State side and see who has a financing statement filed. And there's a safe harbor there um, in, in E that you should run your search not later than 20 days or earlier than 30 days before the notification date when you're going to send out this notice, which will be 10 days before the auction date. So you see how you want to build a timeline to satisfy all these requirements. First, you're going to say, okay, the auction date is going to be on such and such a date, and then that means we want to send out the notices 10 days before, which means we want to run our Secretary of State search um, 20 days before that, and not more than 30 days before that. In a 10-day window, which is 20 days separated from the notice date, which is 10 days separated from the auction date, you build this timeline. But you just run that search 20 days before the notification date, and, and then you wait for the results. And, and electronically, you get them right away. So when you get the results, that's it. You don't have to worry about if someone files a financing statement you know, a day before the notification date. Um, you run that search. This is a safe harbor. You just run that search within that 20 to 30 day period. And then whatever you get, you get, you notify those people. And it, whoever you don't get, that's fine. You're not obligated to notify them. So it's a nice, uh, makes things a little easier for the lawyer that doesn't want to worry about whether someone's last minute files things. So you compile this list of the debtor, secondary obligor, anyone that's contacted you with an interest. Uh, you run your search within that uh, window, that safe harbor window. You put together this nice list of all the debtors, and then you send out the notification 10 days before the auction, and you'll see uh, practice this kind of law and a firm and clients with money. You send out the notification multiple ways, email, snail mail, Federal Express, with receipts to make sure that that notice was received. He won't face any challenges. And then you hold the auction and you're home free. 
So that's a, a quick look at, at um, 610, 611 and the notice requirement. You'll see that there is an exception for um, all of these time-consuming processes if the collateral is perishable. And I'm looking at um, D, 611D. It says, uh, back over here, it says, uh, B does not apply if the collateral is perishable or threatens to decline speedily in value. And that's that's interesting. Yeah, if there's strawberries and you're forcing your security interest to resell them, you can't wait 30 days or 10 days, 20 days. You can't wait. They're going to be rotten. You got You can sell them right away. So uh, these uh, time-consuming requirements of notice are waived. It still has to be a commercially reasonable way to sell perishable strawberries, um, but you don't have to go through this time-consuming notice requirement. It's funny, I remember working on for Apple Computer, actually, on recalling and enforcing a security interest against computers that were sold to, I think, an Argentine distributor that defaulted on its payments to Apple, and the partner I was working for wanted me to make that um, that argument that an Apple computer, no, apples are perishable, but what about an Apple computer? Is that perishable? Well, it says perishable or likely to speedily decline in value. And the partner, and this was successful, at least we didn't get a challenge about it. I think it could be challenged. That Apple computers are perishable or they speedily decline in value. I don't know if they do that. I don't think they do that really between you and me within 30 days. But we all know the technology is very quickly outdated. I have a Samsung 8 hand phone, uh, cell phone. Um, Samsung 9 is already out. Samsung 10 is, I think, out or coming out soon. So technology does decline in value. But whether you can make use of, of this provision to avoid notice requirements, risky. So you better set out the notice requirements regardless. Um, and comply with these timely rules, I think. I think. I think it was a risky move, but an interesting one. Good exam question, but a risky uh, practice strategy. Okay, and what should the notice say? You can see that um, in 613 has it spelled out, and it's basically you describe the collateral and uh, the time and place of the auction. Just give notice to the people about what is happening. Okay, um, that is 135.36. Okay, it says Night Flyer simply sent out her statement saying that the amount she now owed was 3200 She's unsure how Night Flyer came up with this figure. Comes to you for attorney. Uh, yes, you can. All right, uh, what are her rights here? The price obtained at the resale seems suspiciously low to her. Uh, she suspects that the reason sale brought in so little was that the only bidder was Night Flyer Loan Company itself. Can she do that? Uh, can she say that, hey, that you got a very low price for this car? Or if you're selling a Leonardo da Vinci painting, and uh, you contact Rome, you contact Beverly Hills, you go to Sotheby's, you do everything right, you're commercially reasonable, but for some reason that day, no one shows up, and so what you thought was going to be a $2 million Leonardo da Vinci turns out to be a $100,000 Leonardo da Vinci drawing. Can the debtor, on the basis of the mere low price, challenge your resale, your sale of the collateral? No. As long as they do everything commercially reasonable, you can't blame them for the fact that no one showed up. That's a red flag, and you might want to investigate whether they did everything commercially reasonable. But if they it turns out they did, so there's a low price, there's a low price. You know, it's just a bad day at the auction. So the mere low price is not in and of itself grounds to challenge the commercial reasonability of the auction. Um, yes, it talks about... Uh, web addresses uh, rather than physical addresses uh, of the of the uh, auction 
because, of course, traditionally it would be a physical address, actual place where you go and you stand in the in the auction hall and and bid on the collateral. But a lot of things look at eBay, and there are other companies that um, host auctions online. Is it enough to just provide the the web address and the time of that auction online and courts have said yes of course we're moving into a new era so that is the address it's a web address it's not a physical address and that will conclude our study of resale just keep in mind it's really pretty straightforward resale is a typical way to dispose of collateral you can either do it through public or private sale, most typically through public sale, which means an auction. And an auction means it's well publicized. You gotta put ads in newspapers, find out the trade newspapers, the commercially reasonable way to advertise an auction with respect to the collateral that you're trying to dispose of. Advertise it, you provide proper notice, as I've described, then you hold the auction, take the money, apply it. If there's any surplus, it goes to junior creditors or the debtor herself. Uh, and so you know the nuts and bolts of, of um, resale, of sale of the collateral. Keep in mind this two-word phrase, commercially reasonable. Every aspect of the sale must be commercially reasonable. And we have the safe harbor that you talk to dealers of that type. Uh, and then there are the notice requirements. If you know that, you're golden. So let's um, stop our study of sale there. I will be posting another video on the concepts of redemption, where the debtor gets to pay off the debt and keep the collateral. I want my Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci painting. I know I missed a payment, but... I managed to put together this money. I want to pay off my debt and get my keep my collateral. You can do that as long as you follow certain legal rules. Uh, and then there's the the other situation where maybe the the bank would like a Leonardo da Vinci painting in their collection, hanging on the wall of the CEO or in the lobby, under guard. Um, and so they don't want to resell it. They don't want to sell the collateral. They want to keep it, and that is called, for whatever reason, strict foreclosure. Uh, and there are legal rules that govern that process as well, and those two things is exactly what we're going to discuss in the uh, next video. So I'll see you then.